I will show you today Dirt Powered Battery, which is an exciting new area of renewable energy generally. But before that, I was, I, I was asked and really want to, for the first time, show you an 18-month journey that got us to where we are today. And uh, it was a fun journey, and it was a journey that saw my co-founders and I uh, from Sierra Leone, Tanzania, and Namibia and the States um, all graduate from college, but also um, find our own way and also the Dirt Powered Battery. And it wasn't a very easy route. <laughs> so it started in uh, the end of 2007. We were given an art inspiration where we, were, we, were, we worked in a class called the Idea Translation Lab, and we were asked, um, you know, work with the new type of LEDs, polymer LEDs, bendable LEDs. And LEDs are very exciting, they don't use, they don't use a lot of power, and they are very bright. And this was still at the beginning when people were working on art displays using LEDs. And it was very exciting, but they made a mistake when they paired our group together, because we were all Africans. And so it didn't take us long during the class to realize why would we want to work on, I mean, not that the London Olympics is not an amazing thing, but <laughs> why would we want to work on street art displays for the London Olympics in 2012 when we realized that, bless you, that uh, the, the, the LEDs do not take a lot of power, they are bright, they are light, and they're becoming a lot cheaper very fast. So clearly a very good solution for that is, and my, my teammate Steven is from rural Tanzania, close to Arusha, to deploy that in a village. And so then we sort of spoke to our professor and swung it around. And we discovered a, a different problem, um, equally important to you know, the world coming together every four years for a massive sporting event, but one that we felt passionate about. And so there our sort of science journey started. Um, and the problem is this, uh, this is, um, a, an image at night that you guys have all seen, there's no power in Africa. And we all know that's a problem, but why is it a problem? Because people cannot communicate, they cannot con um, engage in commerce, and it fundamentally affects education. So it's a root problem that half of our team experienced. And though I was fortunate to grow up in um, a city in South Africa, I also traveled uh, a lot and, 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 and spent time on our farm and, and know that it's a really personal problem we wanted to fix. So um, how big is the problem? It is an enormous global issue in India and South America. It's one that, that, that um, is similar to and affects the same communities that would use the stove, that would, use, that, that would need medication. And so we're all really working on the same problem. So we discovered our problem and we evaluated different possible solutions. We looked at solar, which is clearly, hands down, right now, the best solution for off-grid electricity. And we realized that uh, solar has seen a lot of investment in the last 20 years, and that's fantastic. And that's why we can have today, uh, you know, modular, flexible solar panels. And so we thought we want to take a small step and see if we can nudge an existing technology, a technology that is almost 80 years old now, and bring it back to the fore. And so that starts our journey with microbial fuel cells. Um, now before I, I share with you what microbial fuel cells are and why we wanted to push them out of the lab, I wanted to say that Africa has this problem of, of lack of electricity, but upon closer inspection, and I think all the appropriate technologists here would, would agree, Africa has a, a different problem. It's not just the lack of resources or lack of grids or the lack of um, oftentimes functioning governments, but it's a distribution problem. For people that uh, try and distribute stoves in Africa or people that uh, try and uh, circulate microfinance to end users in Africa and South America and India and compare different areas, know that Africa has a very unique distribution problem that goes deep into its colonial uh, past, goes deep into its tribal uh, legacy, and it goes deep into, um, if you, you know, read uh, Jared Diamond, the geography. And so we thought, what if we could find a local solution? one that is locally relevant and that um, vibes, or you know, um, as you said very eloquently earlier, um, people understand. It's sort of a one-step a one -step adoption process. And uh, so with that, we set out to investigate electricity. So in the West, uh, we use AC power, alternating current, and it's great, and we have different sources of that, and it comes out of a socket in the wall. And it works really well for us in the States, where we have a lot of power and we have a lot of money. Um, but it, we have to rethink that as a species, and we have to think of why don't we use um, power that that makes sense for the end use. So why are we using a you know, five watt um, you know, phone or you know, small electronic Game Boy using a nuclear power plant not far away, right? That is both very expensive, potentially dangerous, um, or for that matter, coal or other sources. And so Africa, the cool thing about Africa is that if it works in Africa, it works everywhere. And so we started looking at, at distributed types of power. And so you know, solar is a clear winner, dollar for watt, um, kerosene, uh, it's cleaner than most things, but still not a perfect fuel source. Fire is the most common one, and it is devastating our forests everywhere. And then um, wind is actually, to be very accurate, you know, the best yield, but usually in oceans with a lot of upfront in, in infrastructure investment in countries that are not often 
uh, that do not often enjoy stable governments for a long period of time. So it doesn't really work for the way we cared about. And so we needed to store energy. And so we thought, well, what if we can store energy and um, where we make it in the same place? And so we started looking around the labs at Harvard for different um, types of technologies. And we discovered this article sent to us uh, of a professor, Peter Gergius, who works on microbial fuel cells. And we realized, to make a long story short, this has been discovered 80 years ago um, in America. <laughs> and uh, it, um, it's just a technology that a science that creates very small amounts of electricity, a trickle charge, um, that uh, up to now have not really been useful for us because we needed to power fridges and cars and big things. But now, as a people, all of a sudden, we realize that there's 4 billion other people out there that live on less than, than $1 or $5 a day, and that they are a market. And that the things that they use, that we use every day here, phones, lights, and radios, are fundamental tools for democracy and for our development. And so we started investigating microbial fuel cells. And this is where we ended up a few months ago with the Popular Mechanics um, sort of uh, award that we were very lucky to win. And um, those are early prototypes, a very faint light, and in the lab where we started playing with this. And we played in the, in the lab, we found, working with Peter Gogias and reading research papers about Derek Lovely and various other researchers, that the problem is not making these things work. The problem is making them work cheaply and where you need them. So we needed to go to the real lab, right, and away from Oxford Street um, in Cambridge and towards the field. So this is a little bit of a vain photo that we made the same day. But <laughs> it's, indicative of, <laughs> um, it's indicative of the next slide, which is getting, getting to this point, we needed to go to the MIT of Africa with our first field experiment. We, we, we learned most, and we loved this slide, when we went to Moshe and we, we lived with people, and we lived in Stephen's house. And uh, we learned how people use this, this product and, and how they need to use it and how we need to make it. So let me tell you a, bit, a little bit about the lessons we learned. So this is Stephen, went to the village, and this is the original prototype. This is a microbial fuel cell in the bucket, and I'll explain to you in a second how it works scientifically. But it was large, and we lugged 10 of those 10 kilogram buckets full of, we had to taste different types of, um, of mediums, uh, such as cow dung, <laughs> which um, is really dirty, uh, chicken dung, which is very potent, uh, soil, and coffee beans. And so this was sort of the first hard lesson that we had to you know, carry these to a village. We picked the wrong village, and it ended up that the houses were literally kilometers apart. Mm -hmm. And that we made the mistake of not getting a la uh, Land Rover, so we had to walk with these buckets with the kids. <laughs> You know, kilometers from house to house and measure them every day. So it's got a very interesting lesson we learned. So we gave people buckets, and when we came back a few days later, they had um, changed how they used them. So this is a, a family in the Lukeruki village who put a bucket um, with those um, thorn um, brushes over them because they had animals around the house that would nibble at the wires and would break the cell. And so, you know, this is one of many small lessons that we learned, how we, how we get this into the house without putting cow dung next to kids. Um, you know, and there's all sorts of, you know, practical lessons. So that was one lesson. So we then decided, okay, well, let's go from this bucket idea and the knowledge we had gained from being in the field to the second field study, uh, thanks to a grant that we had won for Namibia. So for those of you that know anything about microbial fuel cells, they need water. Going to a semi-desert, <laughs> or a complete desert, um, was a really challenging thing. And we decided to, to do it, not only to because there was a big need in Namibia, but because if we could make a cell work and solve the biggest science problem of keeping the medium wet and moist so as to maintain the current, we would be able to make this anywhere, right? And so we went to the, the place where it's hardest, which is usually, you know, counterintuitive. People go to the place where it's easiest. And so this is a, a dirt-powered battery, a, 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 a very simple schematic. And it's a little bit more complex than this, but essentially it's a Duracell battery, and instead of having nickel and chrome, you have dirt in the middle. What is in the dirt? Um, microbes. So microbes, we all know microbes. Microbes are, uh, the microbial diversity is incredibly important for, for our species, and, and, and it's a big problem, actually. And um, microbes, when they digest organic matter in soil, they catabolize you know, the, the dead leaves, the cow dung, whatever is dead in the soil. And as they do that, they create small amounts, um, a small number of electrons. And this happens all the time all around us. But if you can build a cell that is wet, and has the right spacing and has the right type of anode and cathode that is cheap, then you can maybe jumpstart a small current, a very small current, a trickle charge. And we set about doing that. So let me show you a few of our designs. So here's the um, sort of a, a brief prototype lineup. We started with the bucket, 
they did these really big, porous, um, uh, basically plastic bags that we uh, strapped together. And this is you know, clearly very early garage stage. We couldn't uh, retain the moisture, it evaporated. Then we went towards a Ziploc bags and tried different types of ion barriers and different types of less expensive anodes. Um, that worked pretty well, but the funny lesson here is the, the, a, school, a couple of school students took the Ziploc bags and used it as pencil cases. So we realized that like in such a resource poor setting, if you put you know, uh, $10, no, $5 worth of Ziploc bags in someone's house and the light is like kind of dim and not working that well, they're going to find another better use for it. And so you need to really have a cheap product but also have one that um, is appropriate. And so we, we, uh, that's just for scale. We tested out different types um, of ways of retaining the, the moisture in, in the cell. And then finally, um, this is the, the sort of uh, second beta product, if you will, where we found a way of keeping the moisture inside, having it small and having it be modular. So and I'll show you a second how it is modular. And so this is the idea that we envisioned, and we'll see how this pans out. This is not yet uh, ready as it were. It works in the lab, it works in the small village, but it remains to be seen if we can get this working for everyone wherever they use it, including in the States. But the idea is to use um, dirt as a battery and then uh, take this small trickle charge, and it's literally, depending on how much soil you have, you know, less than a volt and a very small current. And you boost that up and save that during the day because microbial fuel cells work 24-7. So this is a really big plus for it. It doesn't work with the sun and so it can work in cold areas as well. Um, and then that small current can be used to do three very important things for people for democracy and for commerce.